Uh, great. Uh, so we're moving on to the presentations, I believe. Um, is uh, our Bob, are you starting? Yes, I'll start. I'm going to share my screen, Jade. Um, is this showing up okay? You should see a document called Conference Proposal Workshop. I've uploaded that into the chat too, so if anyone, um, you should all be able to download that from here. I'll do that once more just to make sure that people who arrived um, just recently have that, if I can find this window. And this is a PDF with some um, of my own proposals, just as examples and samples. Um, some ideas from Gordon Harvey and Joseph Strauss that I've found really interesting. And I'll talk through mostly conferences in the musical humanities, so music theory and musicology. I come largely from the North American context, um, having studied in the US and now working in Canada. But a lot of these, particularly the first format, are pretty standard throughout, I think, throughout the, the world when it comes to this kind of conference. So I'll be talking about a few different types of proposals. And in musicology and music theory, we see two major ones. Um, one is the kind of short abstract usually 300 to 350 words without bibliography or, or examples. I've seen a few of these today. We have a few of these in our workshop sessions from Joshua, for example, uh, from Gabrielle. So these are common for musicology conferences and many other kind of interdisciplinary events. There's a sample call for papers there if you'd like to take a look at the specifics of what's asked for. But basically, you're allowed to submit 350 words or less text only, which doesn't leave you a lot of room for work. So I noted here, economy is really important. It's important to get to your research question, your thesis really early on, and to find some ways within that very limited space, 300 words isn't very much, to really show the paper's scholarly context, what things you're drawing on, what things you're engaging with, your own methodology. And I'd add also to summarize some of your research findings. That's really important. So that's a lot to put into 350 words, of course. Uh, we can take a look a little bit at how that might work. You can use author date references here, um, things like, I don't know, Natalie Erold um, 2020, things like that, sort of the abbreviated format, even without having a formal bibliography, as we'll see. I'll go on to some examples of these later, but let me talk briefly about the other type. These are seen mostly, I would say, in music theory conferences, where you have a longer proposal, up to 500 words, plus the opportunity to include some pages of examples and bibliography. Uh, this gives you some extra space to document sources, to illustrate theoretical or analytical ideas. In this kind of proposal, I think it's quite useful to use that space if possible, because it really helps to demonstrate that you have findings, you have results that you can deliver on what you're promising. So I think these are much more challenging to write. Um, they really require having the work in a quite advanced state before you can propose it, which I would advise anyway, of course. Uh, but you can really demonstrate kind of the rigor of the methods you're using, um, the details of your approach and so on. In proposals of this type, and I think this may be largely a North American thing or a theory conference thing, um, you can have these pages of example, but it's frowned upon to squeeze in extra text there. You always find on committees that some people try to sort of keep this and squeeze in an extra few paragraphs as the caption for an example. And I have seen some people react very negatively to that. I think they feel like it's um, cheating the format a little bit, that you're squeezing in an extra 200 words somehow. So it's good to stick to very minimal captions with the main argument in the text. I have a nice um, illustration of this from Joseph Strauss, which I'll go to in a minute, but I'm going to just kind of work down through the page here. There are also more specific proposal formats, and I think these are more frequent in scientific conferences. I know for me, the first time I wrote something like this was for the Tambor 2018 conference that we did here in Montreal, where you have a specific area for objectives, methodology, results, and so on. So I'll speak only briefly to those because I think that will be more in uh, Malta's, Malta's area. So I'm going to go on to a few um, useful ideas, things I've come across that I've found useful. Um, not all of these are original, of course, but these are um, things I've encountered here or there. I really liked this um, list of evaluation criteria, and this came from a committee that I was sitting on last year for an interdisciplinary conference, and I thought this was just really nicely summarized. I'll touch on these quickly. A successful proposal should present a new idea, build on an existing one, or define slash solve an unaddressed problem. 
is to contextualize the issue within existing scholarly literature or performance practice. Performance is mentioned here because this was an analysis and performance conference, but I would say in general, you want to show that you're linked to other writings somehow. Even if you're doing very original work, you want to show that it relates to the field. Describe the methodology and offer some evidence of findings. Clearly explain the lecture's recital's contribution and its significance. Be of appropriate scope. I think this is a really important one that people don't always take into account. It should feel like a paper that can successfully be delivered in 20 minutes or 30 minutes, whatever the format of the conference is. Sometimes you see things that feel like they're much too long. There's like a proposal that reads like a dissertation proposal, and it feels like someone will need a few hours to get through all their work. So you want to have the feeling that it will really work in that format. Um, make some attempt to engage with the overall theme of the symposium. I guess this goes without saying for sort of specialized conferences. In general, I think this raises this question of who you're writing for, and it might be worthwhile to think about who your audience is on the committee reading this. If it's a musicology conference, you might say, well, these will all be musicologists, so I can assume a certain level of expertise on their part. I think it's still good to explain terms where possible, um, not to assume that they'll recognize everything that you are talking about, that they'll know all the jargon, all the technical terms. I usually try to write for people who I assume are intelligent, who have a good general background, but who aren't specialists in, in my field. So I need to explain things that aren't clear. This is an interesting one, I think, for all of us working in this kind of timbre and orchestration world, which is a little bit peripheral to traditional musicology and music theory. So um, you do find yourself explaining things more often. I think these other points um, are, are very obvious in a way. It helps if the proposal is clearly written and explained and well organized. Um, I'll talk about organization a bit as we go on. I think using things like paragraph breaks, using some signposts to show what you're doing in each part of the abstract is quite important. Free from errors, I think that goes without question. Appropriate in language and tone, not too colloquial or too adversarial. And where appropriate, supported with examples and a bibliography. So a couple things I like to talk about with my, my students and that I think about myself when writing this kind of proposal. Um, one is this list of three nouns here, significance, originality, and rigor. This was um, something brought to me by a colleague from the UK where they use this kind of terminology a lot. And it helps me a lot to think about what proposals might be missing, where they need improvement, if they're really doing all the things to be a successful proposal as described above. So um, significance to me is about how the work is explained in relationship to, to a field, how it, uh, what's the phrase, how it extends our knowledge, for example, how it expands the field somehow. It's partly about who this is of interest to, showing that your work is significant is often explaining that it relates to other work in the field. So this is where citing resources, citing other people's work um, is quite important. Often if I'm writing about a contemporary composer who might not be so well known, I'll try to establish that they're a significant composer, that they have commissions, performances, and so on, that they're doing something new and different. The um, criterion of originality is also important. And I think this sometimes balances with significance. So in significance, you're always trying to show how your work is part of a field, how it relates to things people are talking about. Originality is showing that you have your own angle on this, your own point of view. So you want to show not only that your work fits into a broader whole, but you want to show that your work is original, that you're saying something that hasn't been said before. Um, often this is summed up in an abstract where you say, my approach will, um, in my paper I will. This is where you're really staking out your own, your own area. And the third one, um, rigor, is important as well, I think. This is one of the things that those longer abstracts that have examples and bibliography um, really can demonstrate well, because you can, show the, you can show the results of your work, essentially. You can show that you have a methodology. You can show that you've been thorough in looking at your analysis, for example. You can show your results in some detail. Uh, rigor also has a lot to do with the methodology. You can show that, look, I have a way of doing this. I've thought about the questions, I've thought about the methods, and I have something that works. And these three things really balance each other out, I think. I think a good abstract has all three of these, 
but you can sometimes find a abstract that seems to have lots of significance, but not much originality. It feels like it's another kind of similar paper to things we've heard before, or something that's very original, but seems to lack rigor. It doesn't convince us that the author can really present, really deliver on the promises because it doesn't have a clear, um, a clear methodology, for example. So a good abstract hits all three of those. And often I think about trying quite consciously to establish each of those in the abstract. I'm going to go on to a couple other things that are also also borrowed, but very useful. Um, I included this whole document called Elements of the Academic Essay by Gordon Harvey. Um, Gordon was a writing teacher and a, a rhetoric professor who I took a seminar with when I was doing my dissertation. And this is a really great two page guide to academic writing in general. But I think that the first two of these points, these are like the elements of academic writing. The first two are really important for conference writing. The first one is the thesis. I think we've all talked about this one before. Um, your main insight or idea about a text or topic, the main proposition that your essay demonstrates. And Gordon goes into a little bit more detail here. It should be true, but arguable, so not obviously true. It should be appropriate in scope. Again, this is getting into that question of what you can hope to cover in a conference paper. And it should get to the heart of the text or topic being analyzed. I think this point um, that follows is really important. It should be stated early in some form, and it should govern the whole essay. Um, sometimes when I see these abstracts, the um, what they say in journalism, the lead is buried. You don't get to the real thesis until the end of it, which isn't where you want to see this. I think it's important to put that quite near the beginning. The other thing I really like in, in Gordon's document is the second point, motive, which I don't think is talked about as much as the thesis in writing, but most good writing really establishes this. And if you read um, good journalistic writing, good nonfiction writing, there's almost always this work on establishing the motive. And he describes this as follows. The intellectual context that you establish for your topic and thesis at the start of your essay, in order to suggest why someone besides your instructor might want to read an essay on this topic or need to hear your particular thesis argued. Why your thesis isn't just obvious, why other people might hold other theses. So this is really um, thinking about making a case for why you have a interesting topic, in a way, this is tied to the significance, right? This is a significance topic and why your particular take on it is original and something that your reader should, should be interested in following up on. So he says, the motive you set up should be genuine, a misapprehension or puzzle that an intelligent reader would really have, a point that such a reader would really overlook. So there's a real point here that you're, you're um, presenting, you're really offering something useful. Um, defining motive should be the main business of your introductory paragraphs. In a shorter conference proposal, we might be talking about sentences, not paragraphs, where it's usually introduced by a form of a complicating word, but. Um, what that means is that often motive talks about what other people are saying about a topic, um, what's known about a topic so far, and that turn comes with the word but or however, you say lots of people have looked at this topic, but no one has considered the way that this source might change our viewpoint on this. Many people have discussed um, orchestration. However, no one has looked at this from the psychological viewpoint. All of these turns there, there's things going on and it's kind of introducing what your original angle will be, but this hasn't been done yet. And that's a nice, uh, nice model, quite a common sort of rhetorical move in academic writing. I'm gonna skip down to another um, bit of advice on conference proposal writing. Again, not my own but passed on. Let me go quickly through this because you have plenty of time to um, browse through this document yourself. This is a document by Joseph Strauss, who some of you might know through his uh, theoretical work on Stravinsky, particularly on serial music. And what I would like to do here is just skim through the generic conventions that he mentions. I give a link to this document in the very first page of this handout. Um, and if you go to the full document, it has a long list of examples of this type of longer proposal. But I'll touch on these steps because I think they're, they're useful and they apply to lots of, lots of formats. I think you'll see as I read through these that there's a real link to the Gordon Harvey stuff I just talked about, the thesis and motive especially. 
So number one, state the problem and say why it's important and interesting. There's your thesis and motive right there, right? What is the problem? What's its importance? You're showing, in a sense, the significance in that case, the significance, originality, and rigor. This is kind of the significance area. You connect with the literature. So bring in some other writings, other scholarship that deals with this. I think this also contributes to significance because you're showing that it's a topic under discussion by others. It's not a topic that only you are interested in, for example. It's a topic that's already talked about. You might have occasional cases where there's very literal literature. In that case, you um, might move on to your own ideas. You might talk about why it hasn't been written about a lot in this particular field. Strauss's third point, identify your solution to the problem. Here's maybe the central thesis statement. And I would argue that a lot of this is about originality. This is where you're stating, this is my part. This is the part that takes everything that we've already learned, that we've already read, and pushes it on an extra, an extra meter, an extra yard. This is where you're explaining what's original in your work. Describe your methodology. This is about rigor, I would say, making it clear that you've thought about your methods, that you are conscious of how they work, you've looked at other options, and so on. Demonstrate specific results. Um, this is, again, contributing to the idea of, of rigor, I think, showing that you have something very concrete to show. And finally, Strauss recommends a kind of conclusion. And if you see how this is uh, phrased here, I will show dot, 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 in a sense, this is a restatement of the thesis. This is something showing that the thesis runs all the way through the abstract, not just at the beginning, but through the end, too. So you're aiming for a kind of consistency. You're aiming for a kind of conclusion. People do this in rhetorically different ways, as you see. But typically, um, you want a quite strong conclusion that really brings things together, that leaves the reader with no ambiguity, no confusion about what your paper says. And I think this idea of stating things really firmly, stating things really clearly, is important. So um, that's Strauss's list. I think there's um, some good points down here as well. Um, including avoiding footnotes as much as possible. This is the kind of format where you can include a bibliography. Um, I would say in those formats where you can't, it's still good to use names and dates. Style and tone, um, absolutely thinking about your audience. I would write very differently for an audience of music theorists to musicologists. And if you zoom out to a kind of interdisciplinary conference, for example, I think I'd write um, differently there as well. So think about who's likely to be reading your work, what they'll know, what they'll need explained. You want to be respectful of their knowledge, but also give explanation where possible. Okay, um, let me very briefly just give you a hint of some of the other things in this document. I put together a few abstracts I've submitted over the years. And um, I've put these up as examples, not just out of narcissism, I hope, but just because these are things I have permission to use and, and don't mind having shared shared outside my um, outside my my own office, my own my own group of students. So a few articles here, a few abstracts here for musicology conferences. I've tried in each of these to find some ways to balance these different things. I'm thinking specifically of that template of significance, originality, and rigor. So um, in this one, I would say part of the establishment of significance is through describing who the composer is, uh, talking a bit about Rebecca Saunders and her role in contemporary music, trying to illustrate quite early on the goal of the paper, which is all about new analytical tools, and then establishing the link to a broader discussion through some citations. This is where you get into drawing on names, drawing on references that are important. You can see that the thesis, I think, is pretty clearly stated here. What will I be doing? What's the original contribution of this work? And then I get into some of the methodological findings. So I'm drawing on aspects of auditory scene analysis. I'm drawing on some of Stephen McAdams' work, 
This is all about uh, methodology, I would say. And at the end, even though there's not much space, and I really felt the lack of space in this one, I tried to describe some of the things that were going on in terms of research findings, some examples of what I was talking about, and also finally to say sort of what is the takeaway. Um, this is my final statement of the thesis idea. It's talking about my methodology, it's talking about my findings, and it's really trying to get to the broader point of the whole, the whole thing. One thing I really do like doing where possible is to break this into paragraphs where each paragraph is clear and you don't just have a block of 350 words altogether. I think that makes it clearer what, what each of these paragraphs is trying to achieve in that case, um, kind of how the argument as a whole works. And that kind of signposting signposting is really useful, giving signs of what will be happening when. So um, I won't go through all of these in detail, but you're welcome to browse through this. Very often, they do involve describing who the composer is, um, illustrating a kind of thesis. Again, I'm, I'm a big fan of thesis, theses being expressed very early on. Giving some examples, but also talking about um, methodology and given, giving some examples of findings. I think that applies to all of these. I'll talk really briefly about the longer format, the music theory format, and then I'll hand things over to Malta. Maybe I'll just do again the first one. This is kind of the 500 word model. You can see that here I was allowed to include examples. So there are examples as well as just text. Um, I would say that still I'm trying to state thesis early to give a sense of um, the link to some things in the scholarly literature, in this case, the writings of Christopher Hasty. We see quotations here from Brise with the short format citation from Hasty's theory of projection. The big difference here is that in this kind of format, you can have a short bibliography and you can really add a lot of examples. That really, I think, does quite a bit to give the sense that there is a, a result to be shared. I know on committees, I'm always very happy to see this sort of thing where I can say, oh, look, they really have this done. This is ready to go. They have their examples ready. This is something that's clearly been worked out and thought about. So here I have six examples, including some text and kind of a table format. Um, I think this is allowable. It's not just another paragraph, but it's kind of organized in a way that goes with the graphics. We have um, similarly kind of a summary here. We have a thesis running throughout the whole thing about the uh, subjectivity of temporal experience in this one, um, going through some scholarly references, going through examples, and really trying to show that there is uh, some rigorous work in, in presenting these results and coming up with the results. So those are the main models. Um, I've put in a few of these, and towards the very end, um, maybe I will leave this to Malta. Towards the end, I have this example of one that was made based on a kind of template. This required aims and goals, background information, methodology, results, and conclusions. So very much kind of a scientific article format. I don't do these very often, I have to admit, in humanities writing, but I would say that the categories are still pretty much right on. Aims and goals reflect the motive and the thesis. Background information reflects the aspects of rigor that you're showing significance by showing how things are related to other literature in the field. Methodology is all about rigor again. Finally, you're showing some results and making some conclusions, in a sense, restating the thesis of the piece. So this was a very specific format limited to two pages that had to include any examples. And it was, you know, again, with these given headings. So I think I'll stop there. Um, Yair and Natalie, I don't know if you want to take questions now, or maybe we should go to Malta and then do questions afterwards. Um, yeah, maybe before we jump over to Malta, I might just ask if there's any short questions specific to Bob right now. Um, you can put them in the chat or raise your hand. Oh, Yuval? Yeah, Yuval, yeah. 
just a question about the the uh, okay coming from mostly the sort of maybe engineering side of abstracts as far as my experience so far uh, but then considering that I'd want to kind of do more things in the theory of musicology um, side of conferences, how uh, common is the um, uh, sort of graphics and so on? Because I'm, I'm used to only text, basically. <laughs> I think the graphics are quite specific to North American music theory, perhaps. I rarely have a chance to include those in international conferences or in um, musicology conferences. So it's a specific genre that seems to have come up around SMT and all of those regional music theory societies. Um, if it's an option and it would be appropriate for your particular topic, I think it's quite a good idea to include them. Um, something without them might feel like it's not fully realized in that context where other papers have them. So um, it really is conference to conference. Typically, the call for papers will be very specific about what's allowed. It will say if you're able to do that or not. If it is an option and if you can think of useful ways to use those pages, I think it's a good choice to do so. Good question. Uh, Theodora? Hi, yes. Um, so it was helpful to see these, these examples because I, I've wondered myself for certain, especially now that um, so many conferences are online and are streamlining virtually, for so many abstract submissions, they seem to have forms that limit your word count as well. So that in and of itself limits the word count for the references, even if you were to parenthetical, uh, you know, parenthetically right. cite. So I always have, um, I, I, feel, <laughs> I feel a struggle within myself in wanting to cite uh, parenthetically but then I'm not quite sure what to do when I don't have the room for the full reference. Um, right. So, If I can go back to those very short ones, um, this AMS style abstract really is limited to 350, I think. And there is that form which only lets you do a little bit with that. Um, I often just mention the author and the date almost as if I had the full reference elsewhere, mostly because titles tend to eat up your word count really quickly. If I give the full title in the text, it becomes both very wordy in a way, it distracts from the argument and it um, takes up some of your quite precious words. So um, here I've just given author and date, kind of on the assumption that it is verifiable if anyone wants to look it up, but mostly I also try to indicate what's going on um, what's going on in each one so what why i'm mentioning Canada because of its distinction why i'm mentioning lockhead why i'm mentioning bregman and mcadams mcadams actually should have a parenthetical um, date there i think to show that it's a specific work and in general um, the other thing you can do is to talk more generally um, in this one i have a bit of a quote from rutherford johnson I didn't even give a date in this case, but I'm, I'm indicating that that's where this idea comes from. You can often get away with that. The assumption, I think, which is fair enough, is that when you do write the paper, you'll provide all of that information. You'll give citations, you'll give page numbers, you'll give titles, and so on, but that you don't need to do that in the abstract itself. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that helps. Uh, you all again? Uh, just another quick question. How different? It seems like these guidelines should be uh, pretty directly applicable to, to paper abstract submissions. Would you think there's a large difference there? Or any, or any, any significant point of difference you want to? Um, I'm just trying to, trying to think about the, the distinction here. So I'm thinking of this as for conference presentations for the most part. You often say those are papers, right? That's um, kind of the, the term of art. Do you mean things for publication directly? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah maybe. I think they're pretty similar. Um, I was talking to someone recently about like a chapter proposal for a collected volume where there was a call for papers. They asked for something quite similar to that. A title, short abstract. I think in that case, you'd do something very similar. So yeah, I don't really see a, a distinction there. 
a lot of humanities fields do work on this kind of 300, 350 word abstract. Something I might mention is that titles are really important. Um, I think the title is maybe the most important part, arguably, of the whole abstract. And that's something it's really worth spending some time on, making sure that it is um, capturing what your paper is about, that it is sort of setting up things in the right direction. So titles are a part of all this too. Great, I think in the interest of time, we'll move on. Thanks so much, Bob, for sharing your expertise. Uh, and we'll take it over uh, to Malta. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, that was really fascinating because I think our presentations are kind of complementary, which is good. And uh, the scientific uh, socialization that I had, had one very strict rule, and that is don't write more than 250 words. Okay. Whatever your abstract might look like, you might write more or less what you want, but not more than 250 words. And um, I, I was socialized in engineering science, and then later I joined a medical faculty, and there things went different. So in the medical faculty, there were structured abstracts with references and much more. And I think we can have a look at this at the end, what would be the appropriate kind of abstract, but I just want to... Uh, share maybe first my slides with you. I have made a little collection, a little PDF document. I put it into the chat. You can have a look and I can share my screen here. And just while talking, I was looking up some of the abstract books that I collected over the years that I will also just hold into the camera during the presentation. But maybe first we run uh, through this little um, presentation that I prepared so that we can have a look how I initially designed the presentation and then maybe we might uh, go broader. That would be maybe very interesting. All right, so I uh, share my screen here. I'm not sure if that works out with the PowerPoint, but I just do it like this. So I share my shared screen like this. So um, I made a little overview on guidelines rather than um, how to. It's more like having some orientation on um, how abstracts could be written. You see, I have not managed to change the footer of my presentation. It was an earlier actor workshop, so it reminded me of earlier work we did together. But uh, I didn't manage to change this in this specific presentation. So about what I'm going to tell you is uh, some statements that I found on the net that are quite interesting because they, as we heard before, can cover very different directions of information condensation in, in form of an abstract. And there are very different point of views on this. It's surprising. And these are very serious opinions, but they probably don't go into one direction, which is interesting, what I found. Then there seems to be some common ground effect, but I actually am just losing this ground <laughs> after your presentation. So we have to see uh, if there is some common ground left after all both talks. And then I will propose a structure that is good for those conferences that I'm joining those kind of uh, thesis that I'm supervising. And so this little word of engineering science that uh, I face every day. And then I collected some hints that might be not found in other context. And I will also give you some source and literature where you can look up further information on how to write abstracts. And I added a little image that I found on my survey to the right. It is by a Finnish colleague. It's, um, it is actually a very nice shape. I will go into detail soon. It is on how this abstract could be thought of. And he makes this idea of a whole glass shape structure where you first go broad, you have some kind of setting, then you be more and more specific. Then you have at the narrowest passage some research question that is only a very, very tiny little thing. And then you get some maybe very direct results of this question. And then you go broad again, you would talk about implications and then you go very broad on the impact, more general, what comes out of your work. And by looking at this, it looks a bit different maybe from what you, what you have heard before when it is about nice pictures. This all shall be put into a very small capsule, like 250 words. That's uh, what I'm now describing and what I'm talking about. 
So some statements first. When I looked into the literature, I found that there are, interestingly, two different words in what the abstract should do to you when you read it. And one statement I found is the abstract should not create suspense. So it shall be objective, no drama, nothing that excites you. It shall be fact-based. And another opinion is from the guy who made this hourglass shape um, picture. We did X and then Rishalras Y, then we did Z and becomes a boring list of results. Two important things are missing, context and excitement. So he says that an abstract should be exciting. And that is interesting. So can it be at the same time not creating suspense, but also be exciting? Maybe not. So it depends maybe on your readership, but we will go into this a little bit later. So there is not a common ground, at least for what shall be your arousal when reading the abstract. Interesting. And the other thing is uh, that when I thought, of course, uh, there is some common ground about when to place, uh, when to write the abstract. And one statement is the abstract is best written towards the end, but not at the very last minute because you will probably need several drafts. So this is always approaching the deadline of a conference or submission of a thesis, but he says it shall be at the end. And the other opinion, again, Zeramecki says, the first thing that you should do when starting a new research paper is to write the abstract. <laughs> so can that go together? Is there any chance to harmonize these two aspects as with a arousal that shall be risen by an abstract? Maybe we can see in the end if there is some solution to it. So what is the common ground then? I think it should always be at the beginning of a paper or at the beginning of a description of any uh, larger work. So it is in the beginning. So it shall be a, also uh, like a condensed version. And this is already under discussion if it just shall be really, really be very condensed or not so in condensed. We heard about several pages of abstracts, but uh, I found a more or less coherent statement that it should not exceed 250 words. Okay, that might be under discussion, so we will discuss. And then about the references. Shall the abstracts contain references or not? Statement from Joe Wolf is no, no references. If a reference is really necessary, then no details, but just the most important things, as you said, uh, Bob, just giving the year and the author maybe. So a very condensed version. And I might add that it might only be then if there is no way to not cite the author because it is so central for your statement that you have to argue with it, even in the abstract. And then very important, the abstract must be self-contained. So it must be available all facts from the content of the research within these few words. And this is a real challenge to put everything into a nutshell but not to refer to other work that you also have to read to understand it. It shall every be, everything shall be in there. And this is interesting. So it shall be a very, very condensed little piece of information. And this is also what makes it so difficult and why people say you have to write it at the end because it is so hard to put everything into one little passage that probably you only can do it when every other aspect has already been thought about. So the processing of your content, what you want to write, must be well prepared so that you can actually have a chance to put it into some condensed form. This is what, what to me gives some reason to put it in the end. Okay, then there is um, something that also is very important. It should always be adopted to the readership. So the first thing that you should ask is who is going to read it? And it makes a huge difference whether your supervisor is the only person who's reading it because you have to add an abstract to whatever you're writing, but there's only one or two people reading it. And even then, if there are only one or two people, one might be the supervisor that has followed your work over years, maybe even, and one might be an external reviewer who has no clue what you're doing, what you're talking about, and he has to understand or she whatever is in this little abstract maybe, because this might be something that your supervisor, you ask just for information, do you want to review my work? And then maybe it's just the abstract. And then the decision follows on your abstract, whether you find somebody reviewing it or not. So it, it might be very, very important 
to think about this peer group that is going to read your abstract. And it's very different also if you're addressing your own community of researchers who always deal with the same stuff and who are aware of all the background and all the pros and cons of doing this or that, or if you are publishing on a conference that has a much broader range, like an international congress on acoustics, and you are focusing on a very small detailed work. So then you have to choose another kind of abstract because if you are using your terminology and you expect the people to have your knowledge, you will completely fail and there will be nobody sitting in your audience. I can promise you this happened several times to students of mine that just thought, but this must be interesting. Okay, it's not exactly the right conference, but I guess there will be people around who like it. And then you have to go a very different way to attract them. That is possible, but it needs a very different approach. Okay, so, and then the main questions to answer, this is also some common ground I found. It is two questions just. It is what has been done and what was your outcome? And even those two questions are not always treated in abstract. So if you read through abstract books and uh, what people have done, sometimes they avoid one or two of these things. Either they just think, okay, this is so common, my project, my problem that nobody needs to know what actually has been done. I'm just presenting my results. <laughs> and the other extreme also happens that people are not daring to show the results in the abstract because maybe they're not ready yet. Maybe they're not worth presenting but we come to this problem then later. All right, another slide on common grounds. It is what shall be in there and whether there should be conclusions or not. Uh, there are some people say, I have not enough space to write about conclusions. But I think the only really interesting thing is uh, to really understand what is the significance of that abstract? Because if you're scanning through a conference proceedings uh, or uh, an announcement, and you want to know where to go and you have the choice between three or five or six different options, then maybe you want to know what came out and you don't want to listen to just the progress of how what they did and uh, what was the setup. You want to know whether something came out. So you probably want to choose those presentations where you can learn something and not just what people tried. And so I think it is challenging, but it is always a good idea to put interpretation and conclusions in the last sentence. And this is where experienced and less experienced writers might differ a bit because this is challenging because the abstract is written quite early at a stage where you probably don't have yet a full overview on your potential conclusions. So this is a difficult part actually. However, if you're writing the abstract of your thesis, then there should be conclusions, definitely. So there is no way to, to get along without. But if you're doing conference proceedings, maybe this part could be a bit weaker there. Then, of course, as you said, Bob, uh, don't use jargon, uh, don't use uncommon abbreviations, and don't maybe use references, if not essential. And it might be if you're if you have to use some abbreviations, it might be needed because it's part of your work, working on these abbreviations, then you have to explain them. But then from your 250 words easily to one third or a quarter might have already begun because there's not much space. So then something interesting, <laughs> a very short sentence, but try to be quantitative, which is interesting. If people might think that abstracts are good for a more qualitative view on your work so that people get a rough idea. It is actually not correct because the more concrete you are, the more attractive your work might be to potential readers who are really in the field and who really want to follow your work. And if, they, if you want to address a broader audience, then you have to put it in a different part of your abstract. But this core question, the really research question should be very concrete and very quantitative. And then another nice word, the Abstract is something like the resume or the distillation of a thesis. So it is the thesis in, in, in short, a large story made short into just a paragraph, which is an interesting idea that you actually put everything, all that you did into this. There might be paragraphs in your thesis that probably don't fit in there, of course. But if you look from a distance, and usually this is very difficult if you're in the moment of writing. But if you step back, maybe a year back, or you read another person's thesis and you have to summarize it, 
you make a distillation, a distillation of it, a resume, then probably the abstract is what you are ending up with. To really put everything in. But everything is a large word. So how can you really get it? And that, re that, that requires that you actually understand everything and that you take out those parts who are really the most important. So that in the end, brings the abstract to be the most important part of any work because it is the artistic condensation of the whole work. So it is a really piece of art to make a nice abstract. And I remember my time working at the Institute of Technics Acoustic, preparing for the German annual conference. The abstract competition was a kind of competition because everybody wanted to write the cutest abstract, the most attractive one, the most interesting one. And if you have a people of 20 people and they all had to go to the conference, they all had to present every year, then this can be very funny because then, of course, you want to exaggerate, you want to push the borders and you want to try out to make the most compact abstracts, the most length, lengthy abstract. So it might be interesting. And this is why I also thought it was a very nice idea to do this kind of workshops because it's actually a piece of art that you're creating. So finally, the last fact part is the storyline. And this is what I just told you in the beginning. It can be seen as an hourglass shape, presenting the broad setting, introducing a more narrow problem and its solution, and then returning to the broader picture again. And this is nice because you get the reader feeling that they start from something that they understand, then probably they fall upon a very concrete problem that they don't understand. But there is a solution, so it gives some good feeling. And then in the end, it is used for something. You see that actually the result is good for something else and just answering this little question that you probably don't really get. But you look then from a distance as the writer of the abstract and find, oh yeah, that is really interesting. Oh, he did or she did something that actually turned into something useful. So if you get this feeling conveyed somehow, then you have a happy reader. So that is maybe not always possible because sometimes this larger view and also the lucky end of a research is not necessarily always given, but you could at least try, give the impression, try to make the reader happy by just using this. And I found this hourglass shape a very nice idea actually. So now I propose a structure, what could be done as an abstract for a journal article, it could be maybe transferred to other kinds of articles, but looking at this hourglass idea and after reading something and adding it a bit from this and that, uh, I think the research background should be summarized, should be evolved in a way that you understand what it is all about. What is the background of this work? And then there shall be a formulation, a simple formulation, but a very quantitative formulation of the research problem. So what needs to be solved? We have some background and we want to know exactly what are you pointing at? What is your work here? And then there shall be the idea. So what was your clue? What was the core of your work? Why did you do it? Because you had an idea. And this idea is why you're doing the presentation, because you want to tell people about your idea. You're excited. You want to teach them. You want to show them something. And then you are going broader again. So you describe the methods that you use. You're just going a bit more quantitative. You're saying, OK, this is what I did. I did this and this and that. Finally, you describe very accurately, but of course, very shortly, the outcome of your method. So what was the outcome? What did you get there? And this shall not be biased yet. You're just telling what you found. You're not interpreting it. It comes next, then you do the interpretation. And it's as in the thesis where you have a real clear structure of telling a story and the excitement comes from the interpretation that you first interpret yourself. And then you try to look from a distance a more general relevance of finding. What is then useful in your finding? Where can it be used? What would be the general ge application of your findings that probably go even broader than your research background that you just opened? That might be nice if you have it. But uh, this is a moment where you say, okay, it could be more or less general because not all research results are really applicable to other stuff. But this is what you could at least aim at. So these seven points, now, my hints, my believing is if you make these seven points uh, included somehow in your abstract, then you will have 250 words filled. If you just use one or two sentences to address each of the seven points,
then you're done. You don't need to do more. You just write it down. And if it's not 250, but 220 or just 200 words, then it shall be fine. There's no need to fill the abstract. Of course, it looks a bit awkward if you have just a very, very short abstract, but we will just see it is possible to have a very short abstract, which is even more punchy than a long one. And uh, so if you struggle, that's my also my believing, if you struggle to write anything to one or more of the points, then you should reconsider to make it an abstract for a sent mission. That sounds a bit sad, but if you don't have anything of this, no idea, or you don't tell anything about your background, about the research background, or you don't see any conclusions here, you're just describing things, then maybe you're not yet ready. You need more time. You probably need to talk again to others. It might be that you say, but this is why I'm going to the conference. I want to show it. But you, you need to think of your readership, your potential readership. They shall come and talk to you. But at least the abstract must be very attractive. So you shall show off with what you do already, what you can do, but it shall be not too short. It shall not leave out something. My believing, we can discuss it. And of course, when you're in a joint group, and you're presenting your abstract, it would be not just nice, but it is also not recommended. It is mandatory to discuss the abstract with everybody. And everybody means everybody. So if there's somebody who doesn't want to talk about the abstract, then it's not a co-author because co-authors are responsible for your research. Each and everyone is responsible for all the whole thing. So everybody should have an opinion and potentially contribute to improvement of the abstract. And finally, then one thing that is also risky, I must say, and I am not a very good example for this, but you should not submit abstracts before you are really sure that the research will be ready at the time of publication. This is um, sometimes you say, okay, I'm going to do this. It's very clear my preliminary results are so promising. But at the time of abstract writing, you have to bring the conclusions. And if you don't have any conclusions yet, you just have the method, everything is ready. And you said, oh, but I, just, I just need to do the listening test. And then finally I will have my results and then I can interpret them. But what happens if your listening tests don't provide the results that you look at, that you expect them to be? What are you going to tell them? And I think if you go to a conference, you find this quite often, that people are just very lengthy on the description of the methodology. And in the end, there is not much time left for some reason that there are no results. And this happens. So I think that is not worth trying because you can use money and time better in more researching or doing other stuff, but it would not be fair to people coming to your conference, to your presentation, taking this 15 hours, uh, 15 minutes away from other presentations that they could join and then just learn that there's nothing. Not much, at least. So I think this is also a reason to consider. Um, if you don't have anything yet and it's not ready, then we aim at the next conference. So don't try to push it if it's not possible. If you have something, of course, but this little spark, the very narrow passage in the hourglass shape, that must be ready to go. If you don't have that, maybe the rest can be a little bit uh, worked around, but if you don't even have that, initial idea and your final findings that you can put your whole story around, then you probably shouldn't go there. Okay, one example for one abstract uh, that I, I like, <laughs> I read it for you loud. Sopranos can sing at frequencies that are rather higher than normal voices, uh, that normal values for the lowest resonance of their vocal tract. But failure to use this resonance would reduce both their vocal power and homogeneity in timbre. Wow, that's one sentence, <laughs> but look at what is in there already. We have directly measured the resonance frequencies of the vocal tract of sopranos during singing, methodology, <laughs> and find that towards the top of their range, they consistently increase the frequency of the lowest resonance to match that of their singing. The whole analysis done in one half sentence. This significantly increases the loudness and the uniformity of tone. And then even like in a drama, you have one turning back, albeit the expense of comprehensibility. So there's even some interpretation here. And the whole thing is just, uh, I don't know, 12 lines or something in this uh, 14 point font. 
So this is an example of a very, very compact abstract. It is from nature where you don't have much space, but uh, maybe you can follow now the idea of what they did. They are going very broad in the beginning, sopranos, like everybody knows sopranos, you're approaching here. And now we are going into some frequency issue and then it's about resonances. So within one sentence, you're narrowing down to the problem, which is the reduction of vocal power and homogeneity at the end of one sentence which is amazing to, to put this into one sentence, I think. And then just we measured something. No method, not much more. If you read it, there's only a very short uh, description of what they, how they actually did it. But they said they measured the resonance frequency of the vocal track. And for those who are in the field, they already know that it's really, really difficult to directly measure the resonances of the vocal track. So now you start thinking, how did they do that? How did they measure the resonance of the vocal track? during singing. So even this little passage during singing implies a lot of problems. If you are experimentally skilled, you know, what? How do they do that during singing? So there's a huge a little universe opening from just one sentence for those who are in the field. For the others, they say, OK, singing reads easy, shall be easy. But there is a, a universe hidden in these words, which I find interesting. And then the finding is we find that towards the top of the range, they consistently increase the frequency of the lowest resin to match that of the thing. This is formant matching. This was known before, but here it is in a very concrete context. So they consistently do that, not they occasionally do or some do, some don't. No, everybody does it. And this is a very general finding here. So it is uh, the first publication that actually has this general statement here. And then in the end, there is some uh, conclusion. So they actually can solve the problem that was uh, discussed in the, in the beginning. They would not reduce their vocal power and homogeneity, but instead they would increase the loudness and uniformity. So the problem is solved. We did it. We just measured something. That's our result. And then, OK, we had to pay for this. Comprehensibility went down. Even the most important finding here for singers that, and the, you could ask a question for the subtitle of the text would not be maybe tuning of vocal track resonance by front. It would, I always teach like, why don't we understand high soprano voices? And this is actually the finding here. So this is a nature abstract, a very compact little abstract. So we had probably 250 words if we want to follow the rules, but they are not used here. So it's much less. But there is actually no word that could be changed. And maybe there's also no need to add anything here. Maybe the method could be, could be mentioned here, but not necessarily. Interested people would just understand what it's about, and they would be going there and want to listen to it. So this is my example of a, of a nice abstract, a very condensed one with a lot of facts, uh, but very, very, very condensed. So finally, some literature, if you're interested to read further, it's worth looking at it. And as with Bob, there is more than just what I said. Of course, those are not just telling about abstracts. It's about writing thesis. And there is actually uh, three, uh, three flavors of Joe Wool's how to write a PhD thesis, how to write a scientific paper. And there's also how to write a Horner's uh, thesis. So he has worked on three different levels. And it's long time ago, it's 96, 2008. But if you read it, there's nothing to add, actually. It is actually a, a very consistent um, list of rules and things and proposals that you could follow. And I like this, Zaramecki, he actually wrote a book. So if you click on that link, you find that there is actually a book uh, that he already uh, published where he, where he condenses his experience. And you see he has a very different point of view, but I like this. So it's actually good for discussion and whether to write the abstract in the beginning or in the end. And uh, there are some uh, more conventional uh, texts like uh, 11 steps to structure a scientific paper with, uh, which editors will take seriously, <laughs> OK? Uh, and there is uh, this Elizabeth Wuna who said how to write an abstract. There are some common rules where I said there is some common ground. But also, 
uh, there is some nice lists. So the last one I like very much. It's a GitHub uh, collection of working in progress list of resources, how to and why, why to do a PhD. So there's a lot of interesting stuff um, on the web. And I think this is where I shall end. And I'm open for questions and discussion. Great, thank you so much. Uh, so let's have a short question period. You can raise your hand or put it down in the chat. Or just talk if you want. <laughs> We're not so many. I'd maybe just make the point that we use abstract in some different ways. We do abstracts for papers that are already accepted, for example, or that we're putting on the top of a complete paper, which is attached. And then a lot of what I was talking about are these abstracts we write and submit somewhere to see if the longer paper will be accepted. And I think they're slightly different. Like, I agree with Malta that that last abstract for nature was really beautifully crafted. But I think if you were trying to just send the abstract to someone, they would say, well, how do I know what you did? How do I know what the method is? It's very minimal because the paper follows in that case, but that's different than I think the abstract is meant to convince someone that the paper is good when you can't see the paper itself. Yeah, and this holds also for presentations. If you want to uh, announce something very new or in a very different field, you have to push a bit harder than if everything is ready and you're just summarizing. So I think that is a peer group that you're trying to address. And if you are publishing at Nature, they have a very strict form. So all these abstracts look like this. There's nothing that is just uh, lengthy, telling something not so concrete. It's always the same story. And if you're trying to write, for example, for a proposal, you have to write one page or half a page of abstract to convince reviewers to give you a lot of money for your proposal then the approach is very, very different. So then you have to bring people from outside to your field and you have to show off. They need to be convinced that you are the guy who can do that and not all the others that are on the desk. So I think that is also a different attitude that it comes up to. But Theodore, you have raised your hand. Yes, uh, thank you. I'm more <clears throat> familiar with this format, I think, um, especially with the, the voice science example that you gave, but I wonder whether you what your thoughts are on section headings um, or particular object just really stating the objective especially for limited uh, space and limited time so that th that it's easily identifiable mm -hmm. i can just say from my experience i worked for a couple of years in the medical faculty and i just zigged out my Proceedings or the book of abstracts from the Coast Action 2103, which was on advanced voice function assessment. And this is a book of abstracts. And I just had a look at it, and yes, they are all structured. So the abstract all reads like uh, objective methods, results, introduction, models, results, references, abstract, method. Results and discussion. So this is very common in medical fields and in linguistics as well. So they also like this. And it is very helpful. It is helpful because you are forced to put into each section at least one or two sentences. <laughs> However, it takes a lot of space. So if you are writing like a nature abstract, then uh, your, your words are, are already used before you wrote a single word. You're just adding the headings and you didn't write anything. So I think it is very different in the culture that you want to address. And here, for example, I find also a lot of images because it is actually on a method that is visual. So these guys said, oh, I'm including pictures because nobody will ever understand when I'm just telling you about visualization of something. I just put one picture, that's easier. And I can understand that depending on your field and where you want to uh, get it published, it might be useful to use the segmented approach, maybe even with references. And in some other context, you have to restrict to the conditions. So my recommendation would be to carefully read what the people who are going to publish the FSEC want. And usually it is written down. So when you go to a conference, when you want to submit your FSEC, somewhere you will read what should the FSEC be like. And it would be good to exercise all kinds of abstracts, including this very, very short ones 
and the extended ones where you can be broader. And I think it's not a question of quality. It is more a question of what are the conditions that shall be fulfilled. And it looks actually awkward if you have up to two pages abstracts and you just have 250 words in a small little section on the upper left corner. That's not nice. So you have to adopt them. And I've, I actually would do it. Just read what they want, just do it. That's a medical abstract, which is actually in the classic format. Marcus has. He is writing about phonosurgical decision making. Form follows function. Okay, maybe no picture needed here. It is just some credo, some some short description, and it is uh, structured, of course, but it's just one paragraph. And I learned, for example, in my university, there should not even be. Um, different sections, so there, there should be just one text without any indention. That's what I learned too. But actually it helps a lot if you have the chance to be a bit more structured here, but some don't want that and you don't do it. Then. Thanks so much, Malta, for sharing your expertise. I think uh, we'll go into breakout rooms now. And of course you can continue to ask questions in the breakout rooms. Um, can I turn it over to you, Matt, to organize the rooms.